manic depressive illness before DSM-3, which occurred in 1980, um, meant the presence of manic or depressive episodes. So if people had uh, only the depressive episodes, they were still diagnosed with manic depressive illness. If they had manic episodes as well, they were obviously also diagnosed. Uh, the terms bipolar and unipolar were developed in the 1960s, 1970s, and then codified in DSM-3 in 1980. And the term unipolar for complicated historical social reasons was converted to major depressive disorder. Um, and they were subtypes of manic depressive illness, but they were separated out in DSM-3 in 1980 as different. And that's an important thing to realize. Manic depressive illness meant what today we call major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder, not just bipolar disorder. That's a common mistake. Bipolar is essentially a rump subgroup of what used to be called manic depressive illness. Most people don't know that, and that's an important thing to realize. Um, now, there were other kinds of depressive uh, conditions before 1980, before DSM-3, that also were uh, not called manic depressive, but now are called major depressive. And that would include involutional melancholia and neurotic depression. So in the case of involutional melancholia, you had patients who didn't have the episodes of manic depressive illness, they just had constant severe depression. In the case of neurotic depression, you also, again, didn't have the episodes of manic depressive illness. You had constant mild to moderate anxiety and depression. Uh, so the, the key to manic depressive illness was that there were episodes, severe episodes of mood states. They could be depressive, they could be manic, or as we'll see, they could be mixed, and they were mixed probably most of the time. Those mood states would come and go. They typically lasted three months, six months, up to a year. Then the patient would be fine or less severely symptomatic for a year or so. Then they'd have another mood state. So these were the episodes. They came and go. They were unmistakable because they were very severe. In contrast, in neurotic depression, the symptoms were there all the time, mild to moderate anxiety, and there really wasn't episodicity. It's just that every now and then they'd be a little exacerbated for a few weeks. Now what happened with DSM-3 in 1980 is that all these different kinds of depression, the manic depressive depressions, so-called unipolar depression, melancholia, and neurotic depression were all lumped together in one category, MDD, major depressive disorder. So major depressive disorder is not even the same thing as unipolar depression, because unipolar depression is a subtype of manic depressive illness. And major depressive disorder includes, includes depressive conditions that are not manic depressive, like neurotic depression. If it sounds to you like I'm speaking a foreign language, it's because you've all been brainwashed with the DSM terms for two generations now, and you don't remember the old language. Now, brainwashing is probably too strong a word. All you've been taught is DSM terms. You don't know the old language. And we need to recover some of this historical knowledge because otherwise we don't understand what the DSM terms mean. Major depressed disorder means many things, and it's not just unipolar depression. And most people don't realize that unipolar depression means the same thing as bipolar disorder in the sense of being part of manic depressive illness. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Another way of putting this is that you can think of unipolar and bipolar as subtypes of manic depressive illness, not as different illnesses. Or to use a metaphor, I like the ice cream metaphor. So manic depressive illness is one illness with many variations, unipolar, bipolar, mixed. You can have symptoms, not a full-blown episode, just symptoms, and that's where the temperaments come in that we're going to discuss, dysthymia, psychothymia, hyperthymia. There's a wide range of symptoms and presentations and mixes. And so the metaphor is it's like ice cream. You can get chocolate, you can get vanilla, you can get swirl, you can get peppermint, you can get a little chocolate chip thrown in there. You can get all kinds of variations of ice cream. These days, hundreds. But it's still ice cream. They're just different kinds of ice cream. They're not different things. And same thing with bipolar and unipolar. They're different kinds of manic depressive illness. They're not different things. They're the same. That's the theory of manic depressive illness. Two different conditions symptomatically really represent two different illnesses. So for instance, if you have pneumonia and a cough, and pneumonia without a cough, those aren't two different illnesses. That's not unipolar pneumonia and bipolar pneumonia, two different things. But we say if you have depression with mania and depression without mania, those are two different illnesses. Well, how do we know? 
could just be like a cough. It could be a nonspecific symptom difference. So the way you know in the case of pneumonia is you look at the pathology of the lung. But we don't have that. So what we do is we look at different lines of evidence other than the symptoms to tell us whether that cough, whether that mania, really is meaningful diagnostically. Treatment. They said that the antidepressants, the tricyclic antidepressants, worked for the depression, and the lithium worked for the mania and the, bi and the bipolar prophylaxis. The neuroleptics worked for the mania, not the depression. They seem to be different. Well, that's obviously false now. Part of the reason you're here is because there are neuroleptics that clearly work for depression. And we now know, we did know then too that lithium worked in prophylaxis of depressive episodes, not just manic. Lithium had been proven effective for unipolar depression for a long time. And then we have lamotrigine more recently. We have some other things that seem to work quite well in depressive phases of illness. And the question has been raised whether antidepressants work in depression, in fact, at all, even unipolar depression. Now, another way of looking at spectrum concepts is not at the level of uh, longitudinal polarity, but at the level of the type of mood episode. So you might ask yourself the question, is there a spectrum of mood episodes? So we talk about mania and depression, but are they completely different things, or are they actually ends of a spectrum with a lot of mixed states in between, which is what, what this slide uh, depicts. If you define mixed states broadly, as we'll talk about, they could be seen as the majority of mood episodes, both in bipolar and unipolar patients. And if that's the case, if uh, only about 20% of all mood episodes, whether you're bipolar or unipolar, are manic, and then 20% are depressive, which is the minority of cases, then you have a whole a problem with this DSM diagnostic system because the system requires you to distinguish mania and depression. But what are you supposed to do when the majority of cases are neither manic nor depressed, but actually mixed? it makes it hard to tell who's bipolar and who's unipolar. Now, going back to the manic depressive concept for a moment, one thing that I think is important in Kreplin's work is I think it's relatively um, rational to conclude from his writings that he thought that the majority of mood states were mixed. That was his interpretation. He defined six different kinds of mixed states and only one kind of pure mania and one kind of pure depression. The majority of mood states were mixed. And that might be a rationale why he did not distinguish between bipolar and unipolar manic depression. It didn't matter to him whether you had depressive episodes or manic episodes, just depression, just mania. A hundred depressive episodes is the same illness as a hundred manic episodes. That's what manic depressive illness meant. It didn't matter. But the reason is most patients didn't really have either mania or depression. They had mixed states. And if you can't distinguish the two, then you shouldn't make that the basis of your diagnostic system. That's one way of understanding how Kreplin thought about it. And research in the last few decades, uh, at least along these lines, suggests that indeed when you broaden your concept of mixed states from the, beyond the DSM definitions, as we'll talk about, then you know, there's some evidence to support that perspective. Now here's a little pyramid that shows you one way of thinking about the different definitions that we're going to walk through. DSM-4 viewed mixed states as full manic and depressive episodes. That's the most narrow definition. DSM-5 broadened it, as you'll hear about more this morning, to include non-overlapping uh, symptoms. So if you had depression with non-overlapping euphoric type manic symptoms. Uh, other researchers suggested a broader mixed definitions, which we'll talk about. Now, one mixed definition is the bipolarity specifier, one of the broader ones. And this is from Angst and Benazi and others. You just take the DSM criteria for mania and hypomania. You throw away the duration uh, cutoff, which would, with the viewpoint being that it's not scientifically validated that four days it is a meaningful cutoff to begin with for hypomania and one week for mania. Um, and you See how frequently people have manic symptoms, multiple manic symptoms in depressive episodes. And it, in this large study, they found that about one half of people with depressive episodes had multiple manic symptoms. Now keep in mind, this is both unipolar and bipolar individuals. So it's consistent again with the old manic depressive illness concept. It was validated with the diagnostic validators because there was an association with antidepressant-induced mania and higher genetic loading in these patients for bipolar illness. 
I, I talked to a few colleagues who were on the DSM-5 task force about this, and I asked them, you know, why this study didn't get more attention, especially given the validation with genetics and treatment response. And they said, well, only 20% of those patients had family members with bipolar. So even though there's a fourfold increased likelihood of having family member of bipolar, that's a relative risk. The absolute rate was only 20%. 80% didn't. And I asked my colleague, though, yeah, but it's only 20% in people with bipolar type 1. <laughs> that's the way it is in bipolar. You don't get 50 to 80% family members with bipolar. You get about 10 to 20%. That's the rate. So this is actually very consistent with the type 1 bipolar research. Here's a study by Cassano, and that is that maybe the core of mania is psychomotor activation. That when we say someone's agitated, that means they're manic. There's no other way to be agitated, unless you're talking about side effects like akathisia or something. But in terms of psychopathology, if you're agitated, you're psychomotor excited, that's what used to be meant by the concept of mania from the second century BC till now, till 1980. Then DSM decided to change it. So we think of mania as the DSM criteria, but from the ancient Greeks till 1980, mania was a term that was used for someone who was psychomotor excited. And now in this study by Cassano, what was interesting is that they took this concept of psychomotor activation, accelerated thinking, hyperactivity, restlessness, then they mapped it onto the bipolar-unipolar distinction, and they found that indeed it predicts bipolar diagnoses, that if you apply DSM criteria, bipolar diagnoses very well. And uh, it, it is the opposite of the, the uh, unipolar diagnosis. So the idea is this psychomotor activation really may be very central to the whole concept of mania. And this led Kukopoulos to put out this hypothesis, which he called the primacy of mania. And that is that you don't get depressed unless you're manic. The two things go together. Or as he put it, mania is the fire and depression is the ash. Mania causes depression. Depression is the effect of mania. There is no depression without mania. That's his hypothesis. Now, there are different ways of looking at this. We've spelled this out in this article. But just to point out for today, in the concept of manic depressive illness, all being one illness, is partly predicated on this perspective that these things go together. Now, you might say, well, what about all those unipolar patients who never have mania? Yeah, but half of them have mixed states. So they do have manic symptoms. A third of them have cyclothymic and hyperthymic temperament, so they do have manic symptoms. We just have been ignoring all that. So if you take this broad definition of psychomotor excitation as mania, and then some of them do have the classic bipolar manic features of hy hypersexuality, etc. If you take it broadly, you will see that even the majority of unipolar patients have a manic aspect to them, either mixed states or affective temperaments. This led Kukopoulos to make the, give the following definition of mixed depression, which is basically a clinical depressive episode, as you know about it, but added to marked irritability, rage, mood lability, uh, etc., impulsivity. So, in short, psychomotor excitation in a highly depressed patient is a mixed state. We've actually been um, reviewing Kukopoulos's own personal experience in Rome with decades of his practice. He passed away a few years ago. We've since published some of his own uh, chart data. Um, and in Rome, in his practice, about half his patients met DSM criteria for bipolar, half MDD. About the majority had hyperthymic temperament based on his clinical assessment. And when you looked at how that played out in treatment, about half the cases have had mixed states related to antidepressants. So antidepressants cause and even worsen mixed states in his clinical experience. And just as bad with the SRIs as with the tricyclics. And there were two and a half times more suicide attempts in the patients who were on antidepressants and got mixed states as opposed to non-antidepressant related mixed states. So when we say antidepressants don't improve mixed depression, we, we mean they can actually make it worse too with increased suicidality. And with one, a mean of over a year of treatment, uh, Kukopoulos' patients were taken off antidepressants. In the end, only about 3% were treated with antidepressants. One third were on mood stabilizers, one third were on dopamine blockers, my, my preferred term to antipsychotics. Quarter got ECT. Their Hamilton depression rating scale scores fell from 28 to 8. 
and about half of them were completely cured and never had another mood episode again. Now keep in mind, these are half unipolar, half MDD patients, not bipolar, just bipolar. So 3% got antidepressants, including all these so-called MDD patients, and they got this much better compared to having had much worse symptomatology beforehand. And this is my last slide. Um, when we looked at the phenomenology of their mixed state, they all had psychomotor agitation, because that's part of the definition. And the most common manic-like symptoms that they had were flight of ideas, distractibility, and irritability, which was present in about 50 to 60%. Um, now, one thing to point out about this is that this is different than the DSM-5 definition, which doesn't allow you to use agitation, distractibility, and irritability as part of your definition of mixed states. You can have those symptoms, but that's not how you can diagnose DSM-5 MDD with mixed features. You have to focus on grandiosity, pressure, speech, et cetera euphoric mood. Now the problem is, if you have depression with euphoric mood and grandiosity, you're probably not all that depressed. Um, and Kukopoulos, before he passed away, wrote two editorials criticizing the DSM-5 definition of mixed states. And in speaking with him, he one time, one, what he said was, this isn't really mixed depression. This is mixed hypomania. You're taking the, the mildly elevated, mood elevated, grandiose patients and they have dysphoria and depression along with it. And that's what DSM-5 is calling MDD with mixed features. Um, but this kind of mixed depression is, a little more dep is much more depressive rather than manic. They're very depressed, but they have irritability, flight of ideas, and psychomotor agitation. That's the picture. I'm sure you've seen lots of patients like this. That's the picture. It's broader than the DSM-5 definition. The DSM-5 is certainly a step in the right direction and you'll hear much more about it the rest of the morning. But I wanted to give you a, a larger context in which to uh, understand and appreciate that as well. So I'll stop here, and I appreciate your attention.